I'm Del the Trader, and welcome to Bear vs. Pig. This is a series of interviews with seasoned day traders who have found themselves trading inside one of the stock market's most volatile and shrouded niches. These are traders that have managed to break through the gauntlet that is discretionary day trading, they've become profitable, and have emerged on the other side triumphant. Let's lift the veil and begin exploring the minds behind this niche. Today I'm interviewing Ricky Analog, as he's known on Twitter. Uh, you can find him at Ricky Analog underscore STN and uh, at Ricky Analog. He's a moderator over at StockTraders.net. He's been trading for a number of years uh, and he trades both small cap and large caps. If you're following him on Twitter, you'll know that he has one of the most entertaining feeds in the small cap world and the way that he goes after these small caps, uh, usually posting his branded Ricky tips. Uh, meme style uh, photoshopped images uh, basically stabs at crappy micro cap stocks that might be running that day or that week um, but however behind the memes is a solid understanding of both fundamental and technical analysis uh, he's also running a how-to series on YouTube to help teach people how to dig into the financials of a company so I highly recommend you follow him and uh, let's pick his brain and see what uh, nuggets we can extract it's not often that we get somebody on that's had the balls to create videos on um, <laughs> filings research because, you know, guaranteed 100% you're going to get a thousand questions related to those filing uh, videos and you'll never hear the end of it. So, uh, Ricky, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, man. Awesome. Uh, so for people that don't know who you are, uh, why don't you just give us a little quick intro as to, you know, who you are, what you trade, uh, and then we'll dive a little bit into your, your personal background. Right on. Um, well, I am, I guess in my, I'll keep my age a little covert. I'm in my mid thirties and, uh, I'm a moderator over at StockTraders.net. I've been trading going on, right? This is almost my five year anniversary right now, actually. So, nice. um, I still consider myself that, uh, consider that extremely rookie, I'm um, not under any sort of uh, I'm not naive enough to think that that is any sort of experience level or anything. So um, but at the same time, like I've been through the ups and downs and I've you know, I've found consistency and I found profitability and have been able to sort of find my little uh, spot in the world of trading. Um, <clears throat> been through a few different chat rooms. Um, I'm really happy to call stockchairs.net the home now and uh, found a good core group of guys that I trade with and uh, formed a bit of a little bit of a brotherhood over there. So uh, it's really nice. Um, I trade mostly, I guess people think that my specialty is the the micros and obviously because I do a lot of the stuff with the fundamental research on the, the filings, but I, I do trade a lot of the large caps as well. Like um, especially lately, anytime it's earnings season, you know, a lot of the micros kind of taper off and uh they've been extremely dead lately so and i don't want to sit around twiddling my thumb so i actually i trade the the large caps uh just as much if not more sometimes than the micros and uh, i have really good success with them as well yeah that's awesome that you do because you know especially right now a lot of people are twiddling their thumbs and that's probably the best thing for them to do i think the worst thing a trader can do is Force trades in a market with no volume, no volatility. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so you're, you're a trader at StockTraders.net. Um, I actually had some experience in that room back in the day um, when I was when I moved over from futures into stocks. I wanted to see, you know, who the players were, you know, what people were trading and all that type of stuff. And I signed up to that room and just kind of listened, watched, you know, and not not the paid one, just the free one. Um, so uh, that was my little interaction with StockTraders.net. But um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about, you know, how you got involved with those guys? Yeah. Um, well, like I started the first chat I was in was, uh, which is kind of funny, is um, it was Spartan Stocks, which I did the interview like a month or so ago with under PDT. And uh, Will Weiss is um, one of the guys that runs that podcast and he is actually the creator and uh kind of the the 
head guy over at Spartan Stocks. And so I was over there and then I kind of did my own thing with a discord room, had some friends, you know, I think a lot of people kind of go that route eventually. And then um, I had a friend that, you know, had just kind of clued me into StockTraders.net. And this is back when they were really just, just starting. They uh, had just started a discord room. So I poked my head in over there. And uh, I was there and at that time, you know, I was in Spartan Stocks and I had my own Discord room and then I was in their Discord room and I was like, oh man, like I got too many things going on at the same time, not enough screen space. And I was like, so I kind of stopped hanging out in there just because I needed to be able to focus on what was uh, obviously trading first and then trying to help out some of the guys in, in my own Discord room and contributing in Spartan Stocks. But uh, I think a few months after that, somebody had said something about it and I, I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about them, you know? And like, I went to check them out again and they had just migrated to like a web-based uh, room and it was, I guess what they call STN uh, 1.0. And mm -hmm. it was, I mean, not to knock them cause I know there's a lot of stuff. Like I know all the behind the scenes stuff that goes on with their, their uh, system now. And it's a lot of work to get like a, a website designed and to run and function properly. Oh, yeah. And, um, so it was, I don't mean to knock them when I say this, but the version 1.0 is really kind of clunky. And so I didn't, I didn't kind of like hang out there very often just because one being on a web browser, uh, I had to have a whole window open for it or whatever. And <clears throat> so it was kind of like, once again, I, uh, strayed away from them for a little bit and then I went back and uh, I think I just had started posting some stuff about somebody had mentioned a ticker and I was like, oh, you know, like you should probably look into uh, the warrants or something, something fundamental on the company because it was a turd. Mm -hmm. And I think I just caught the eye of uh, one of the moderators, Rob, at the time. And he DM me and was just like, yo, like I noticed you seem to know like the fundamentals on a lot of these turds, like I, I kind of started making it a habit. I'd poke my head in over in the pre-market and I'd see what tickers people were talking about. And I would just drop like, I guess like now I typically have what people know as the Ricky tip, which is uh, yeah, the turd great. in play. Yeah. So like it was basically that back then, but without, you know, it was just quick drop in the, the, the quick and dirty on that ticker and let people know what to watch out for, what kind of overhead supply to expect. And so he kind of just like asked me if I'd be interested in uh, maybe helping out and seeing if there was like a place for me over there. And um, I told him at the time, you know, I definitely would be interested in discussing it and thinking about it. And but I also knew I had other obligations at the time. So uh, he put me in touch with Titus, who is like owner uh, slash head moderator over there, um, him and uh, Monaco Trader, the guys that started it. And um, he talked to me for a little bit and, you know, like I know about him and I knew who he was. And so like to speak to him uh, in a voice conversation at that time was kind of uh, daunting to me because I was like, you know, this is a guy I've looked up to for a long time. He's a big trader and he, he's, a, he's one of the best hands down that I've ever had the honor of watching trade and trading with. And so when that guy's talking to you and like asking you, would you like to help out with stock trades net? Mm -hmm. It was like a no brainer. It was a, a definite, yeah, let me see what I can do to contribute to the community. And that was actually, you know, kind of, uh, probably what got me started making the videos was the ability to realize that, uh, giving back to a community has, it has its own bigger purpose. Right. And so I think that was the natural progression was like helping out that community and then realizing, you know, like you don't have to only help your community. You could put stuff out there, some content out there that could just be helpful to anyone that's not necessarily in stocktraders.net, but something mm -hmm. that they could use. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's it's really sad that a lot of people don't share because they they assume that because they're not, you know, a veteran 25 year trader that they don't, you know, have the right to share what they're doing at the time, but uh, it's really important to, to to share something that you're you're becoming proficient in, even if be, before you come become proficient in it. Because number one, you get feedback from the community, which is super important to your development. Um, and then number two, uh, it also helps people expand their horizons and maybe think a little bit differently about a specific subject. You know, so helping giving back to the community—that's what it's about. You know, not 
not having to be the, the most advanced trader talking about a particular subject. Yeah, we all start somewhere, right? So like, you might not know everything there is to know about filings, but if you know like some of the basics, I guarantee you there's people out there that don't know that, that you could at least enlighten them that part of it. And then, you know, in my eyes, the way it works is that you get what you give. So like, I feel like by putting this out there, it, it always comes 360. So like I've had so many positives come out of sharing, uh, the sec filing stuff that, you know, I never would have imagined happening. Like people just being like DMing me like, yo man, did you know about, uh, X, Y, Z had blah, blah, blah coming up on this date. And I'm like, I'll go, I'll go dig on it. And it's like, there's no way I would have ever had that on my radar had this person not reached out and told me, but that person would have never reached out and told me, uh, had they not, um, found some value in what I was providing. Right. So it always comes, always comes full circle. And it, to me, it's always worth it. 100% agree with that, uh, for sure. Um, okay, cool. So you've been trading for five years, you trade small caps, large caps, uh, stocktraders.net is where people can find you. Um, and you put out these Ricky tips on Twitter. Uh, so one of the things I always wanted to ask you about Ricky t- tips is you're, you're pretty creative with them. I, how much time <laughs> do you say you would spend? Uh, and this is like the office space scene, you know, how much time, you know, per week would you say that you spend, <laughs> uh, in Photoshop editing Not- these Ricky tips? Uh, images not enough man um honestly they they take uh so the research that goes into them is about five to ten minutes on a ticker and then the editing of the the whatever the the thumbnail that i create or whatever is is maybe another five or ten minutes and it's all done on my phone uh the editing the the photos are done on the phone the the research is obviously done on my browser and uh i I keep what I call like my sacred scroll. It's just a word document of all these tickers that I, I research every morning. Mm -hmm. And then when, uh, when I make Excel sheets on each one, then each Excel sheet gets saved to a specific folder for that ticker. And so I've got a pretty good Rolodex of stocks of, of, uh, repeat offender turds. And so like a lot of times it takes a lot less of my time than people would think. Um, they're but, pretty uh, creative, man. Like they are up there, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Cause, um, somebody in stock net actually, I think had come up with that idea, they're like the turd in play. And they're like, Oh, just call it a tip. And I was like, that's awesome. And, th- but then, you know, like it became like this thing where I wanted to make like a, a subtle joke out of it but at the same time i got to keep it sort of pg so like even though i'm calling it just the tip i'm like <laughs> i'm like looking for pictures i'm like what can i use for a picture of a tip of something that's not like gonna offend people <laughs> so Man, like, it, we're t- it's talking be- to traders the last thing we are is uh, pg <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know I, I at the same time i do represent like stocktraders.net and i always keep that in the back of my mind so um i'm always True. trying to make sure that like even if i uh, crack jokes and stuff. I try to keep things semi-professional and, um, hopefully everybody, uh, is able to have thick enough skin that they yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> awesome, man. Keep them coming. Um, uh, I haven't done one in a minute and it's funny because I just been, you know, moved out to the West coast. And so I wake up at 4am Yeah. and then I've got, now my kids are back in school and starting daycare and So like, there's a lot of things where I feel bad because I'm not able to always get them done. But at the same time, I'm like, dude, there hasn't even been a ticker in the last I can remember that was even deserving of a tip. I was like, dude, it's got to deserve it first. Yeah. Um, So some of the things that people love to hear about and I love to hear about is just getting an understanding of why it is that you took the path you did into trading and what made you pick trading as a profession, you know, and then also what your life is like right now. Right on. Um, well, I, so I've lived all over the place. Um, I'm, I'm dual citizen, Canada and U S and, uh, no Canada. um, Yeah, exactly. That's where most of my family's up there. And, uh, I, I ended up in Hawaii and finished out my university there at the University of Hawaii. And I, I got a degree in marketing. And um, 
I I run an online retail business with a business partner who a lot of people, you know, maybe not as many people in the trading world know him as much as outside of the trading world, but he's really uh, made a name for himself in social media. And that's uh, Reezy Resells. And he, we basically run an online retail business where most of the stuff we sell is through Amazon. Um, we sell through other venues as well. But um, we grew that business since I think we've been partnered together since like 2012. And, you know, it got to a point where it was pretty much passive income where we had hired people, we have warehouse space and we have everything kind of like a well-oiled machine just running. And so it gave us, it gave us some time to develop our own like paths that we wanted to take. And I, you know, had always been interested in the markets. And I think I actually thought that you had to be some sort of genius to trade or to um, understand the stock market. And so, but I, I mean, I'm not an idiot by any means. Um, and so I started picking up books and like I read one of the first books I read, I don't know how I got turned on to this, but it was the intelligent investor by Benjamin Graham, which was the infamous Warren Buffett, uh, material. And, you know, I read all that and then I was like, I started thinking, you know, I think I could do this. So I started reading more and it was funny cause I think my first inclination into the markets was that I was going to be, I was going to invest. And, yeah. um, my business partner agreed that we had like enough money in the business account that we should open up an E-Trade account and I could manage it. And it was a small amount. I think it was like 10 grand or something. And, uh, I remember the first thing I bought was Amazon because we ran an Amazon business. <laughs> I bought hey man, it. That like, makes sense. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I bought it at like three three thirty or something. And I sold it at like three sixty. And I thought I was like a genius. And now in a high knowing what I know now and like looking at Amazon and where it's at now, I'm like, oh my God, that was disgusting. But uh then, so like I said, I'm, this is going on five years right now. So like we're coming up on the anniversary. And if you guys remember five years ago from this point in time, we were in the pot stock boom uh, version 1.0. And it was uh, it was crazy. It was um, everything was flying. Everything was going to the moon. And so, you know, I found out about Twitter and how cash tags worked and started following people and uh, fell into the whole um, I guess the pitfall most young and new traders fall into, and that is following people and just buying stuff blindly and thinking it's going to the moon. And so like, needless to say, uh, we ended up kind of getting into the pot stock right around the top. And this is before I knew what shorting was. Everything was only long. It was all in an E-Trade account. Uh, wasn't for day trades, you know, so we were buying stuff and like holding it and praying and, and everything that 10 grand disappeared rather quick. And, uh, I'm not the type of person that looks at that as like a failure. I'm just like, nah, it's okay. I, obviously there's something I'm missing here. I need to learn more. So, but my business partner was like completely turned off from the markets after that. He was like, <laughs> F that. I think cause at that point, like we had both also started personal E-Trade accounts with like even less than the 10 grand. So like, I think we had the 10 grand together and we, I think we each had like maybe five grand in separate personal accounts. And those, those disappeared as well. And he was like, dude, nah, I'm not trading anymore. F that. And, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. but, um, I stuck with it and he ended up going, uh, the social media route. So like he started educating people on doing online retail, uh, through his Reezy resales, YouTube page, which is kind of funny because it's like now he's gotten so good at all that. It's like I definitely have somebody to consult when it comes to making my videos or making, you know, how to uh, optimize them for search engines and all this stuff. But uh, awesome. Yeah, that's that's pretty much how that happened. And like so I got my butt kicked like bad the first few years of trading. And I know everybody can relate to that. Um, But I honestly think that that's probably the best thing to happen. Because yeah, I mean, it's the gauntlet, you know, some, some traders will go through it and, you know, they'll, they'll get a, a finger lopped off and they'll be like, you know what, that's it. I'm never coming back. And, you know, it takes the right type of person to say, you know, I got nine more fingers, so let's go for it. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I always think that maybe that actually helps skew that, you know, the, uh, cliche, 
um, statistic that everyone quotes of, I think 90% of <laughs> traders fail or whatever you want to say, yeah. 95% where, well, if you take into account, I think the majority of people that just fall on their face right away that never get back up and try again, like if you remove them from the equation, the people, I think they get back up and try again. I think you're probably out of that group. It's a lot less than 90%. I think that would, I would say fail. I think oh, yeah. um, from the people that get back up and know how to brush themselves off and teach themselves and, you know, are disciplined, those are the ones that stand a much better chance to begin with. So if you remove all the people that are just like chasing, uh, the next shiny object, which <laughs> it's funny cause that there's so many correlations between this and the online retail. So like online yeah. retail experienced the exact same kind of boom in the industry where it became like the cool thing, work for yourself, sell online. And like all these people were, that's why like Reezy's, um, YouTube blew up because so many people wanted to learn how to make money on their own. And, uh, really most of them were just chasing the next shiny object. And you see that in trading too. In general, I think people give up fairly easily, especially when they find out that something's harder than they anticipated. So, yeah, I mean, a, a better stat, I think, would be how many people um, have failed over how much p period of time. And, and an even better saying would be 90% of people fail, not just yeah, fail at life. trading. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because the, you'll fail at anything if you give up. So, and, yeah. and the other thing well, is you can't fail if you never give up. So Yeah, there's, there's no... Uh there's no diet pill. There's no, um, <laughs> there's no easy button trading is, uh, it takes work. It takes, um, a lot of hard lessons. It's so funny cause you can tell somebody all the lessons you've learned over the years that like, don't do this, don't do that. And yeah. the majority of people need to learn the majority of those lessons the hard way. Absolutely. Um, so where, where do you live right now? I mean, don't give us your address, but tell us in general <laughs> what, where you're located and what's your, yeah. your personal life like? Yeah. So I am, uh, we just relocated from North Carolina to San Diego and, um, my wife is a Marine and I actually met her in Hawaii. Wow. And so that was, uh, you know, trading in Hawaii was crazy cause the time zone. So anybody that thinks that, uh, California is tough where I live now, um, you don't understand what it's like living in Hawaii and trading, <laughs> but, uh, California, I'm in San Diego. Um, we've been out here since I think July, and uh, life is finally starting to settle back down because um, we drove a camper, like a, a, I think it's a 30 foot camper. I pulled it with uh, the SUV across the country. And that was with a uh, seven or eight month pregnant wife. And wow. uh, <laughs> we have a, we had a, um, how old was she at the time? Like a, a one year old or a one and one 16, 17 month old in the car the whole way and an eight year old. So it was a, a crazy trek across the country. And I, I drove the whole way. Like I wasn't going to make my pregnant wife drive. Well, I mean, um, I think she probably had to be a Marine in order to survive. Dude, that, she's, right? she's tough, man. <laughs> but like, so we got out here and it was funny cause we didn't, um, have a place to stay or anything. We were just going to stay in the camper at a, um, an RV resort or whatever until we found a place. And, we didn't find the place that we're at now until I think we moved in one week before the baby was born. So it was like really wow. cutting it close. So moved in, had the baby. We didn't even have any of our furniture yet because the movers hadn't delivered it yet. And so we had went out and like bought like a dining room table and chairs and a, uh, a couch. And we were sleeping on the mattresses from the camper. We brought the camper mattresses in the, uh, the house and we were sleeping on those till our stuff got delivered. And, um, now all of our stuff has been delivered. Uh, the, the baby is, uh, three months old now. So like finally at the age where he can hold his head up on his own, which is like, I don't know if you have kids or not, but that's like a huge, uh, a milestone because you no longer have to like hold them as quite as careful as you used to. And, uh, they can do a lot more. But, um, there I have they, one baby as my computer and that's about it so far <laughs> working on it that you know of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, um, yeah. And like now they just went, uh, they just started up at this new daycare and, uh, it's funny. This is their first week back at the daycare and lo and behold, my eight year old daughter is home all week long for, I guess the, the schools here in California are out the week leading up to Thanksgiving. So oh, nice. I, 
thought I was finally going to have like my trading desk and my peace and quiet while I trade and nope, got the eight year old home, but it's a blessing. I mean, we all know that's one of the biggest bonuses to being a trader is that you have all this, uh, uh, free freedom to spend time with your family and you don't have to call your boss to ask off for work. That's why you do it. Right. I mean, that's the whole, the whole point, I guess. Yeah. All right. So you, you put out a lot of videos. Um, and you know, one of the things that strikes me is how consistent you are just on your, looking at your Twitter feed. Um, I've been following you for a while. Um, and I, I love how you approach breaking down a ticker. You, maybe you can dive us into a little bit about like tell us about the small cap world the way you see it and the way you trade it and you know give us like your priority list for what's important in this world all right um so i i'm i always say this and i know it i know a lot of people wish that i had some kind of uh golden easter egg answer for them about the filings but uh, it's always technicals first with the the micros. And um, even though I know that there's all kinds of crazy, crazy shenanigans that go on in the behind the scenes with these companies, um, it doesn't ever change the fact that you have to use your technicals in order to have sound risk management. So, um, and with the micros, you know, I think what draws a lot of people to them is the giant moves that they can make. So knowing that they can make giant moves, and I guess I guess I should preface this with I I don't very often I don't uh long these. I'm almost I would say ninety five percent short bias on on all the micros. Um mm-hmm. and <clears throat> so knowing that and knowing that they make these crazy runs is what forces me to really, really wait for them and be patient for them to get to a point of how, how extreme can it, can it get? Right. So the more extreme it is, in my opinion, and this is going off the fact that if you are short bias on a, something that is running a hundred, 200% or whatever, then I think by default, we would agree that you're playing a mean reversion on it. So you mm-hmm. are trying to you're trying to use some form of analysis to spot the top. And then you are trying to figure out a way that your strategy allows you to get in as close to the top as possible so that you have something to risk against. And then you are trying to fade that ticker back to whatever your targets are. And hopefully you know how to set targets correctly that are logical, rational targets. And um, so the more extreme something is, the more two things, the more likely the mean reversion will happen. And when it does happen, the, you are more likely to have better risk reward because the target should, I mean, if something's up 300%, then it's safe to say there's some meat on the bone. Now by extreme, by extreme, you mean uh, like price range or, well, yeah, that, and I typically go off the ATR. So like I prefer things to be extended at least five times range. Um, of what it normally trades. And that's where I start to get intrigued by the ticker. And then obviously there's other factors like the daily chart matters immensely to me. So sometimes I'll see a turd run in and you know, like we go through so many of these turds that, um, you will forget about one for, you won't have it on your screen for like maybe a year before it gets mentioned again. And then by the time you go look at it, you realize the daily chart looks nothing like you remember it. And it's now like formed like what looks to be a very nice curling bottom. And it's been kind of building a nice, as far as technical analysis goes, it's not uh, in that death spiral downtrend that a lot of the tickers I prefer are in. And so like if you get a daily chart like that, I'm a lot less inclined to want to short that just because I know that it doesn't have, I mean, the longer something curls and flattens out on the bottom. Like if you have a really long base, the Mm -hmm. longer it's, it's giving uh, bag holders a chance to kind of get out and, um, you're not going to have as quite as much overhead resistance just from bag holders, which, you know, the, the typical turds we like are in those really crazy looking downtrends that typically result from the reverse splits and the toxic financings and the, uh, all, all the stuff that kills a stock, right? So those are the ones where 
when I see them gapping 50% in the morning and getting some extension off the open, that's when I'm like, all right, this is starting to be extreme and you got the daily chart to go with it. And I think that I guess that's a good thing to point out to, to listeners is that every trader should probably have a list of boxes that you need to check off for something to meet different criteria for you. So like, um, if it's, if you're into shorting those pigs, which a lot of people are, you need to have things that give you extra conviction. So a 50% gap, that's, that's on my list. It's on my watch list, but it's not going to be enough to just by that sell by itself be enough for me to want to take it. Right. So, uh, up 50% daily chart looks like, uh, a half pipe or whatever you want to call a quarter yeah. pipe to the left. Um, there's another checkbox. Uh, the sec filings reveal there's tons of, uh, people that have warrants up higher and we're gapping into those levels. Check that box. Um, you know, the, we get extended intraday and the range is now like it's traded over five times. It's an ATR. Check that box. And the more mm-hmm. boxes you check, you know, the more conviction you should have that this trade's going to set up for you. And then even when you check all these boxes, it's so funny. I mean, I miss so many trades because even when something sets up with all the boxes checked, it oftentimes still doesn't present the technical setup that I need for me to personally take the trade. So like, it'll just be like so juicy looking and I'm like, Oh, you know, but at the same time, if I don't have my discipline, then I don't have anything. And so I hate that as well. Like the worst, the worst (laughs) thing ever is when you check all those parameters is what we call them with our group. Yeah. It's like, once you have those parameters checked, it's, you're looking for the trade, you're looking for the trade and it just, you know, rips down. Let's say if you're looking for a short, and it gives you no entry opportunity from a technical level. I mean, just hey, the worst thing is you just have to let it go. Yeah. And like you, the, <laughs> Twitter always exacerbates that feeling too, because you'll see everyone on Twitter that crushed it and they'll be like posting their charts and their, their P and L's <laughs> and all this stuff. And you're like, why, why couldn't I just be, why couldn't I be in that trade? And then you realize you're like, oh yeah, because I have something called discipline. And like, That's if right. you, if you like break down a lot of those trades, a lot of the people that are nailing those, the ones that don't give us the setup we're looking for, it's because they're probably just shorting the front side blindly. And, you know, that that works until it doesn't work. And then yeah. so, I mean, kudos to them for nailing that trade. But kudos to me for uh, having the discipline that's going to keep me in the game for another five to ten years. Yeah, there's always another trade. I, I think that's that's what people yep. have to remember. It's just that feel of feeling of FOMO is so dangerous. It's like. It's like crack for traders, you know, just stay the whole way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so how would you define as like the, the opportunity in trading these micro cap, um, stocks? Like what's the main opportunity there as opposed to just trading large caps? Well, I mean the opportunity, it, if, if it sets up right, it's always good. I think, um, one of the things that I like to point out is that when the, and this isn't just with micros, but I just think anytime you have something that has higher volatility, what that should equal to you in your trading plan is smaller size. And people see these like micros and they think because they're so cheap that you should be like taking, uh, if something's $5, you should be taking 10 times as many shares of that as something you would take that's $50. And I don't necessarily think that correlation is correct. And so there is a lot of opportunity in them, but if you are taking on too much size, I think, and not able to sit in it, like I see a lot of people that are just taking like five to 10 cent scalps on these. And if that's the plan then that's the plan and I'm not trying to knock it, but like, that's not my style of trading. Like mm-hmm. my opportunity lies within trying to find something that is extremely extended, identifying the top, putting on the trade as close to what I think Basically, the trade thesis is this top is in now. Where can I put the trade on and what size do I need to use where I can risk over that high so that the risk reward is there? And then from that point, once the trade's on, it's 
first target or stop and that's it there's no in between uh, at least there shouldn't be and like i'm i'm human so i make mistakes and there's often times where like maybe i don't feel quite comfortable with the size i put on and i'm i'm starting to scale out a little before the first target and you know that's it's all psychology it's you know you have too much size on if you uh aren't comfortable enough to let it go to its first target or you're not comfortable with the fact that you know how to pick a correct target mm-hmm. um but the, you know the opportunity for me is saying that this should fade all day or this should go to this target and then from there it's it's if you ask me and i try to point this out in some of my trade recaps or my twitter posts is that the way i trade a nvidia or a netflix or a whatever i'm trading that day they're fundamentally the same the same uh concept of how i trade them which is if I'm trying to fade it and it's something that's getting extended to the upside, then I'm trying to put it on as close to the top as I can. And I am trying to capture the meat of the move, which Mm -hmm. to me is first target. And that's where I'm locking in. And then from there, if it wants to give more, I have some shares left for that move where it does give more, but, uh, you know, so so you're not a fan of scaling in You're you're more of the, I want to get in at the, at the what I think is the top and then hold through a pullback? Yeah, well, I do scale sometimes. And the thing is, is my scaling is not like what I think most people are accustomed to seeing, which is, you know, kind of having areas where you'll, where you'll start in on something as it's moving up. Like I wait for a lower high and then I'll wait for a, a level to break to confirm. And from my experience in back testing things, you know, uh, it – a lot of it comes with with experience, which it really sucks to to say that because you can't just teach that to somebody. You have to you have to be in these trades so many times and watch it happen. But um, so the larger caps, if something, and I guess this goes for the small caps too. But what I tend to find is if I have a level that I'm watching as my trigger level that tells me, okay, now the trade's ready to be taken. If the price bounces off that level three, four, five times then I am probably going to take the trade at least partial size right when it breaks that trigger. Because mm-hmm. I, from what I've experienced and what I've seen through my back testing is that those are the ones that don't always or very, very seldom give better prices or prices closer to the high where you would like to enter. Now, if something just flies up and then comes down, makes a lower, uh, a low pushes back up, makes a lower high and then falls through that low. I don't take anything at that trigger point. What I do is at that point, I'm waiting for better prices because oftentimes what I find is that when it just falls through first try, either I don't want that trade or it's going to give me better prices if I'm patient. So when I scale, what I do is if I put on partial size, because it maybe bounce off that level a few times and may put me in a position where I am going to take partial at the trigger. What I do is I'm only putting on, uh, maybe 0.5 R or maybe even less, sometimes like a quarter R, which obviously is, uh, whatever I have deemed my full risk on that trade. And then at that point I I have a spreadsheet I use, which helps me kind of calculate how much to add at whatever level to get me as close to a full R as possible. Um, And so what I do is like I'm looking for a push back up towards the high where I'm risking against to actually scale in then. So like I'm not scaling as it goes against me. I'm scaling as it gives me opportunity to get better prices after the trade has already confirmed that it's a valid thesis in my in my strategy. So first, it's always got a trigger. And at that point, then it's like, do I take it at the trigger or am I waiting for better prices? And am I scaling as it kind of pushes back up towards my level of risk? So that way, like whenever I, if I ever do stop out, which is all the time, I'm not here to pretend like I'm right or anything a lot. Like, dude, that's the best thing about trading is that you don't have to sit around and act like you're always right, man. Like I'm wrong so often, but I got bulletproof risk management. So like I'm able to sit here and like I could have a trade on right now while we're talking, doing this interview, and it wouldn't even affect me because I can throw a stop on and I don't have to sit there and watch every single tick. Like, dude, if it, if it pushes back up and hits my ads, that's great because if one of two things are going to happen, it's going to fill my ads and then it's going to go in my direction or it's going to stop me out and it's a controlled loss because it was a pre-planned 
stop out. So, yeah. And so maybe you can share like some of the details around your risk management. Like what would you share from your risk management? Um, if somebody wanted to get started on position sizing and risk management, uh, what tips would you be giving them? Okay. Um, so for starters, um, try to adhere to at least a two to one, but I know, and this is something that's as, as cliche as it gets, cause you'll hear it regurgitated on Twitter and everywhere, but three to one, uh, reward to risk, but that there's a reason that gets regurgitated because mm-hmm. you need that risk reward or reward risk. Uh, you need that so that when you are wrong, it's just a minor scratch. And when you're right, that it's their bigger wins so that it outweighs your losses. And, um, the way I do that is you have to first know where your trigger's at and where your stop will be. And, you know, from that point, so if we're talking about a mean reversion and you've got a lower high, then what you're saying is that this is going to change trend. It was trending up and now it's going to trend down. And the only way for something to trend down is for it to make lower highs and lower lows. There's no other way for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And so if you know that, then you can wait for your trigger and you know that if this is going to continue down, then it shouldn't come back above a a certain level. So that level then becomes your risk. Knowing where your risk is and knowing where your entry is gives you the ability to say, okay, here's my stop. It's 20 cents away from my entry. So is the first target where, and this is a mistake a lot of people make, they'll go, okay, well, I've got a 20 cent stop. So I, my first target is 60 cents from here. It's like, no, that's not how that works. You don't get Mm -hmm. to tell the stock where it's going to go. You have to know where is a logical, rational target. And there's basically you need to, what I always tell people is zoom out to a different time frame. So oftentimes if you're trying to revert, uh, do a mean reversion trade, it's probably spiking on a lower time frame. So the one or the five minute, but where is it spiking into? Like what time frame is the trend actually different? So if you zoom out to like, let's just use the daily chart, for instance. Um, a lot of times the things we're shorting are these downward death spiral trends, right? So obviously any giant spike is really just a pullback into the bigger time frame downtrend. And so where can this go back to. And if the answer to the question, where is your target is then at least two times further away from your entry than your risk. And hopefully three times, then you can put the trade on and you know, the correct size to use. And you already know that if you get paid, you're getting paid three times what you're losing. And that's what helps you put your mind at ease, helps you, uh, not get, to the point where you're stuck to your level two in time and sales and watching every single tick um, allows you to trade with less emotion. Are you using like a percentage of your account to, to, um, to identify what your R is or are you yeah. using a different method? Yeah, I, I currently use 1% of my account and um, it works well. My accounts, I'm definitely not under the PDT. Like I don't, I'm not going to go into the details of my account, but it's large right. enough that just risking 1% on any given trade is more than enough to have ample gains and to pay the bills and to, you know, just be consistent and happy. And uh, I think a lot of people, you know, probably, I think that's where a lot of that stems from is that they, they, they don't have good risk management because they have to risk too much of their account in order to make a gain that in their mind is justifiable to trading. Right. So like Mm -hmm. they're trading with a $3,000 account, but they want to make, they want to make 500 bucks a trade. (laughs) And you're like, well, what are you risking on your account to make that? Because you realize that you are going to be wrong every, like, I mean, you got to track your stats too. That's the other thing. If you don't track your stats, you don't even know what your win rate is. You don't know, um, what your expectancy is. And those are really, really key details to know as a trader, because if you trade in a $3,000 account and you only are right half the time, but you're trying to make $500 a trade, I hope your risk rewards in check because, uh, <laughs> you're going to, you're going to blow your account up really fast. You know, when people extrapolate as well, they see a $5,000 account, they're like, oh, I'm making, 
you know, $100 on a great day, it's going to take me forever to get to that $25,000 PDT rule level, you know? Yeah. So, well, and I also think that if you're trading, so if you're trading a small account, I'm just making the assumption that you're probably more on the novice side and it's not to knock you or anything, but it's just to like lay out some, uh, some basics to the, the thesis here. And that it, one is you're probably newer. So the problem a lot of the newer guys make is they are constantly obsessing with how much they're going to make on a trade. And I, if you're new to trading, your only thought should be like, how much am I possibly going to lose on this trade? Awesome. Some really good tips there and some good nuggets for people to um, research when it comes to risk management and some of the technical aspects of trading small caps. Um, let's get into the fundamentals. Maybe just walk us through um, the process. Like I'm not going to want all the details from the videos. People can just go watch the videos. Um, but maybe you can walk us through the process of once you find one of these Ricky tip worthy stocks, um, how is it that you go about um, diving in um, and how do you go from like top of the priority list to the bottom when it comes to fundamental analysis? Right on. Yeah, um, I actually, I wish I could find it right now. I, I DM somebody that asked me kind of that. Uh, they wanted to know if I could make them a order of operations for pulling up filings. And uh, you know what, that might be one of the next videos I make, but it's funny because I've been doing it for long enough that I don't really ever think about that. I just pull up the BAMSEC page and go to their, their filings and I'll look and see what's there first. And from that, you know, I see what's most current. I see like, you know, you can take a glance at a BAMSEC page and you should be able to go, Oh, well, they've been doing some recent offerings. You can just see by the dates on like any of the prospectuses. Um, or you can be like, oh, well, they just filed like certain times of the year, you know, like everyone's filing their quarterlies or their annuals. So or you'd be like the most recent thing was they did a, a, um, a shareholder meeting and voted on something. What was it they voted on or and from there, you know, that's where I decide where I'm going first. And so it, it does differ immensely from from ticker to ticker, but learning how to identify like what their most current filings were and then that should get the gears turning in your head like, OK, what does that kind of say to me? So if, if I see they did an offering recently um, within the last few months, that's probably the first place I'm going to go. I want to the first thing I want to know is. Well, what did they sell shares at? How many shares? Who bought them? What kind of offering was it? Um, I also really recommend learning about uh, go back more than one offering. Like look at offerings that were six months to a year because oftentimes, you know, a lot of these, the guys, the puppeteers, we call them, the guys in the background pulling the strings, they tend to uh, hang around, play it cool for a while till people forget about them. And that's when they, you know, that's when the, the fluff PR comes and you, you get hit with some overhead supply that if you didn't know how to find it, you didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. um, and like we actually, you know, how I said everything comes full circle, right? So like I actually had somebody DM me, uh, maybe was it yesterday or the day before? And they were just asking me about um, the NBEV offering from August and you know, they're like, well, what about, uh, what date do you use for figuring out the lock of expiration? And yeah. I was like, I was like, Oh, well, you know, like I haven't looked at NBEV's, uh, August offering for a minute. Let me go back and look at it. And then sure enough, like the lock of expiration on the shares, the insiders bought, um, they spent like two and a half million dollars at a dollar 78. Those things got, those things were free to trade today. So mm -hmm. there was a, a definite reason to want to short NBEV today. And it was like that came full circle. That was somebody reaching out to me, asking me something, which in turn manifested in a trade for me, which was awesome. But it's like that's one of those things where you really need to go back and look at the older ones as well, because there's oftentimes uh, warrants that weren't exercisable until six months out. Um, get used to uh, setting alerts in your 
uh, phone. <laughs> I use my yeah. phone all the time. Like I'll, I'll get a message like, Oh, wake up. You got a short blink today. And I'm like, awesome. <laughs> uh, for myself, uh, when I'm doing the research, I find a company that's not terrible, you know, like their quick ratio isn't like under underwater. Um, and they've got these offerings and it looks like they want to do that. Some of that diluting and type of stuff. Uh, how do you separate the good from the bad in a situation like that? Um, well, for me, a lot of it has to do with, uh, so depending on who has the overhead, right? So if it's somebody that you know is a repeat offender like um, Maxim or H.C. Wainwright or Roth, any of those guys, you know, um, <clears throat> or Sabby or, I mean, I could, the list goes on and on. But mm -hmm. uh those are the kind of guys that they're not going to care about the company or the shareholders. They're caring. They only care about themselves. Now the, the companies, they conduct offerings because they need cash, but there's different reasons you need cash, right? So some companies just use the stock market as a printing press. Other companies, you know, like the, by and large, I think the majority of offerings come from biotechs and biotechs usually don't have revenues. So they have to. And like a lot of times you have a biotech that maybe is not, you know, you can't just point at it and say that's a scam. No, like the lifeblood of a company is money mm -hmm. and they're going to have to have it in order to run their their trials. Clinical trials are really, really expensive. And um, so a lot of people, I think unnecessarily call a company a turd because they do an offering or something um, yeah. like t take TNDM for example uh, that company was getting bashed to the ground by everybody when it was in the five dollar price range and it went to 50 and it's like you know maybe it's a turd maybe it's maybe it's not but like one you probably should have listened to price more than the filings and you know if a company is able to make new highs after doing an offering and still continue an uptrend. That's kind of what I use is so did they strengthen their balance sheet through the offering to the point where it's going to get them through their clinical trial? And do you think like it's a, uh, like it's kind of, I guess a bit of it takes a little experience, but you know, like the, the ECYTs and the, the TNDMs and the, the GLYCs, the ones that do the offerings and then, you'll see like the after hours drop from the, the offering and then you'll see like it get bought back up. That's kind of usually the, the give or the, the tip. That's like the, Hmm. I think all the shorts that just shorted that on news that the offerings out are probably all going to get screwed over tomorrow morning. And like, then you kind of watch the price action afterwards. And, uh, from there you, you can usually say, all right, that's a hot stove. Don't touch it. Is there a technical setup that you're like, if there, if there is a technical setup, are you taking it despite there not being like a strong case uh, from the fundamental side? Um, I think so. Uh, it just depends. So like if we're talking about a company, like again, I, I like to revert back to the, the, the shorts on the extremely extended ones. Um, I only have like, I, I, I'm a pretty boring trader, man. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 guess, short, I guess what I'm trying to get at is how important is the fundamentals when the, the technical shows up? Well, I, so I definitely read the filings on something to see if there's something to give my case a little more confidence in the trade. Like if there's no overhead supply and something's flying um, and there's no there's no fundamental or sec filings that are giving me that ex extra confidence in it. Um, it, it does have to get extended quite a bit more for, to pique my interest because, um, a lot of times on those extended ones, you know, you're kind of counting on, uh, some sort of overhead supply to come in and create the downward pressure on the price. Uh, you know, sometimes it'll just be bag holders. It doesn't have to be, uh, in the filings. You could look at the daily chart and go, yeah, dude, I don't care. There's no red flags in the filings. That daily chart's a red flag. Um, but, uh, you know, if the daily chart's not a red flag, I'm trying to remember a recent one because it happens a lot. Like, I get, what, I get the question you're asking, and I just wish I had an example off the top of my head, but it does happen a lot. But, like, I say it all the time in chat. I'll be like, dude, like, everybody's probably itching to short this. 
And I would say don't. It's probably an avoid for me because um, there's no red flags. I'm sure everybody's looking at the, it's, but it's in the three dollar price range. It has to be a turn. Like I don't care, man. Like if it goes from three to like six or seven, then talk to me. But like it's uh, and oftentimes pre market, you know, it's like a three dollar stock gapping up like twenty percent, and everyone's got their got their locates already, and they're ready to nail this thing. Like it's up. 20% like what ugh, I'm all right. <laughs> I'm like my main job. I, I feel as like a chat moderator is, is trying to protect the, the community. So like I'm always the guy saying like, be patient, wait for it. Don't, don't hit it yet. Like, and it sucks because I'm wrong a lot. Like I'll be like, no, I wouldn't short that yet. And then it works out perfect. And I'm like, yeah, but the times when it does pay off, to avoid the trade, that's when it's like, you know, I'm so happy that I was able to hopefully convince some people to not get involved in that yet. So one of the questions that I get often, and maybe you can help me shine a little light on this is, uh, sometimes you'll have a technical setup, um, and then you'll have really strong fundamental news, uh, which is great because they go hand in hand. Um, but what if you've got that technical setup and then the fundamental news is the opposite, kind of going against. Um, one of the things that I tell my traders is technical number one, you know, and then just use fundamentals uh, to help mm -hmm. supplement your idea. Um, yeah, so like you're spot on when you say technicals first, because um, if there's no news and there's no reason for it to be running, but it's running and it's on a pump, like it... <sighs> it always comes back to the fact that when it's ripping on the way up, it's doing one thing and that is making higher highs and higher lows. So like, there's no reason to short that. Um, at least in my opinion, you can look at the daily, like dude, perfect example today is a N Y right. Any. Mm -hmm. So it's like after hours right now, it's, it's almost up at highs and it, you know, it, from a technical perspective, it's a, it's a turd. Like we don't have to argue, uh, whether or not a and Y is a turd cause they are. And like the filings prove it, but like there was no news. Right. And we, I don't have to say why this thing got propped and squeezed or whatever, but like, um, it's, it's one of those things where, okay, if you were short, let's say you shorted the break of four on a and Y today and it, it gave you pretty much the, in my opinion. So this is where setting, uh, your targets comes in. Mm -hmm. So it, from four, that, that 50 cent dip in the four fifty was right into one of the moving averages that I would have used as a spot to say, look, this has reverted as far as it needs to, if that's all it wants to give. So I would have definitely been locking some in at that point. Right. And from there, like it gave the perfect long setup. And so like what I always tell people is <clears throat> you need to know the opposite side of the trade. So if you're short, you need to know what longs are looking for. And if you're long, you need to know what shorts are looking for and what I use for my stop or the, so my initial stop on a short is high day, which is the trigger for the long, which is why it's my stop. Right? So I'm, I usually give it 11 cents. So it's just some wiggle room, but, uh, and I size accordingly, but, when I'm stopping out, it's because the trade has triggered a long. And once the trade goes to the first target, then usually my next stop becomes a long trigger uh, from where we're at now. And mm. A and Y gave the most perfect long trigger ever when it pushed back up to the four level, pulled back, uh, and then broke four again. Mm -hmm. And so if you were in from the four break and you lock some in at the first target, and then you just took it off on the next long trigger, which was through four, you would have been break even on the last half or whatever you had. And you, or maybe you even had the foresight to say, look, this is a long setup right here. And you actually flip long. You probably would have made mm -hmm. a killing today on a and Y, but it's all technicals. So it's, I mean, 100% technicals. And, uh, I want people to know that they need to go back to the November 20th chart of a and Y, uh, 2018 just in case they're listening to this in the future. Um, so yeah, just looking at A&Y, look, A &Y, looking at the chart, um, if you had the strength as a trader to continue trading until 2.30 in a market where nothing was moving, 
Um, <laughs> and you decided so to go long on ANY despite the market selling off, then you deserve every penny of this move. Um, so um, what do you do to, to track your trades and how does it affect your level of confidence in a trade? Um, I use TraderView. I used to use Edgewonk and nothing nothing against Edgewonk, but it's uh, I just feel TraderView gives me more... Uh, it gives me data that I would have to do some tricky Excel sheet work with, with edge wonk to get the same data. So like, yeah. I guess I'm just, I guess it's a, a little bit of laziness on my part that trader view makes it so easy. Um, but it, it's a super powerful tool. And like one of the, the things I do every weekend is I just spend a little time looking over. So I will, uh, sort my trades by loss, like largest loss to uh, largest win and I just start up at the largest loss for the week and I work my way down I go look through every loss and I, I say was this trade one was it a valid trade or did I break some rules and two if it was a valid trade was there anything I did wrong or something I missed and if it was something where I, I did break some rules then I need to try to figure out what and like sometimes I'll take notes to in trader view or maybe just jot them down on paper but I'll I'll think back to what was going on that day that caused me to, you know, think like, okay, now I can break a rule. And I'll tell you right now, my number one problem with rule breaking is always the same. It's every week. It's, uh, I, I get nicked on a trade or two for anticipating a break instead of waiting for the break. And <laughs> it sucks because you're like, ah, it's such a dumb thing. And by and large, the majority of them that, uh, end up triggering, and I, and I did anticipate it. So like, let's say, uh, the, like with a N Y, right. The break of four was the trigger, but I anticipated it at four twelve and got lucky that it broke instead of just holding four and ripping in my face. Um, most of the time when I look back on those trades that I anticipated, it breaks the trigger and then comes back to where I anticipated anyway. So I'm like, dude, it's such a big old, like <laughs> middle finger in my face. Like you idiot, like dude, just wait. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And people really get caught in those squeezes because of that. I mean, just going back to that ANY chart, you know, right above 410 at about 254, right before that big volume squeeze above the previous 420 or 430 high, man, mm -hmm. that if, you know, people were holding, maybe, you know, maybe they had their stop above the previous high and they just got squeezed the hell out really fast. Yeah, and you can tell too when you look at it that uh, there was probably quite a bit of people that were just trying to be patient and wait for the pullback to get out, and yeah. it never it never retraced back to that four thirty level. It like retraced to like four forty three ish or something, and then it was like you could tell people that got squeezed and got caught started realizing this might not retrace all the way, and everybody started covering again, and it was just a yeah, it was a bad squeeze. Awesome. Um, is there anything you want to say about the, uh, anything else you want to say about, uh, the fundamental side of things? If people have, uh, questions, like I, I answer all my DMS, like I'm, I'm an open book. So like I answer all the comments where people ask questions on YouTube. I answer DMS and Twitter, like, uh, people come over to stocktraders.net. I'm totally accessible. And, uh, but it, it's tough because they're, they're so complex. All the filings are extremely complex and there's no, yeah. uh, it's no, it's no secret why they don't want them to be easy for you to read. Uh, and uh, honestly, like I've been doing it for a few years and I know that I don't even know everything. So like I'm sitting here trying to make videos where I'm like, uh, sometimes I'm actually worried I'm going to get like a, a message from a, a peer of mine and be like, Hey, did you realize that you said this? And actually you should, <laughs> you know, like so far so good. I've, I've actually haven't had that happen. I have had one thing where I think, uh, what was it? The float calculation where I think I included a guy's, um, stock options that, uh, shouldn't have been, but it's not a big deal. Like I think people got the gist of it. But, um, yeah. yeah, I'm human. I hope everybody understands that. And I'm like, on top of that, like I haven't been putting them out quite as often as I was for a little while there. It's just family life. And I'm trying to like also walk like that fine line of family life and balancing, uh, both moderating at stocktraders.net and a lot you know, of work. Finding, dude, it really is. 
I mean, just this podcast alone, you know, people have been messaging me. It's been a, a little bit since I made another one. Um, it's because like I'm a, I'm a trader number one, you know, just like you. So, but it's awesome to to hear your point of view and to hear traders like you come on and just you know spill their guts about what they're doing because you know at the end of the day what I want to do and I always tell people this it's um, you have to believe in that highly iterative um, cycle of learning like yeah. strong ideas you know held lightly and yes. the whole idea behind that is you know try to find those people that are going to prove you wrong you know even if it's uncomfortable for you um, because that's the only way to advance yourself in your craft so yeah. uh, Definitely want to thank you uh, for for coming on board and sharing with us. Not a problem, man. I'm happy to do it. And uh, like I'm always on open book. So anybody that wants to go ahead and reach out, um, like I said, my DMs are open and come find us at stocktraders.net. We have a free trading floor, like he was saying. Um, and uh, we have a three uh, free day. Wait. I always mix this up a free three day trial to the the premium side as well. And like we do screen share every morning. There's some really, really powerful tools. Um, do you have any uh, shout outs you want to give to anybody? Um, well, yeah, for sure, man. Like Titus and goose and Monaco and Rob over at stockchairs.net for like giving me the opportunity. Like I felt like, uh, that was just an amazing opportunity that they extended to me and I'm happy I took it. Um, my, one of my mentors is, uh, JM who's all day holds on Twitter. He is, uh, <clears throat> that guy is an amazing trader, a great friend. And, uh, I've got, a, there's so many people that just contribute to our stock community, but they all know who they are. And I love all you guys. But yeah, that uh, and my wife. <laughs> and my oh wife, yeah, that's I a good one. I was gonna say, just you know, can't leave her out. <laughs> yeah, I will. Um, I think we answered all of the community questions. I kind of built them in there in a really sly way. Um, <laughs> so uh, I hope you had a good time, and I definitely want to have you on in the future for an update um, and see where you go with these YouTube videos. Also, if people want to follow you on Twitter, why don't you give them your address um, and also give them your YouTube address. Okay, um, on YouTube, it's just Ricky Analog, and I, I have two Twitter accounts. Uh, you can follow either of them or both. It's uh, Ricky Analog is one, and the other one is Ricky Analog underscore STN for stockchairs.net. And um, yeah, give me a follow. Uh, give this guy Dell a follow. He's a good dude. Um, Thanks. And I, Dell, I just want to throw this out there, dude. I am so appreciative of what you do for the community, um, and I'm extremely uh, overwhelmed that you gave me the shot to come on and, and do the interview. Awesome, man. Well, you know, I bring on people that inspire me. So thanks again for coming on and, uh, we'll good luck in the market tomorrow. Now, if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider subscribing on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter at Dell, the trader. You can also find us in a whole bunch of different podcast services. You can head over to activetraders.chat where you can see the article and the resource links. Uh, and all of the show notes. And if you have any comments or questions or suggestions on what you want to hear on the show next, uh, be sure to follow me on Twitter and you can message me there as well. See you on the next episode.